Beautiful. Okay. So thank you all so very much for joining. Very excited to see you all here today. Um, as you all know, we have Dr. Jonathan Cleveland with us today. Uh, let me give a little brief intro and then I'm going to pass it off to John and he will amaze us with his knowledge and um, training, quite honestly. We're very lucky to have him. So John completed his PhD in clinical psychology here at NOVA in 2015. He's director of adult psycho psychology at a large group practice in southwestern Ohio, and he serves as clinical faculty at Wright State University School of Professional Psychology. Over the past few years, he's developed a clinical training program where doctoral students and postdoctoral residents learn to work with complex trauma and dissociation. John's published research has focused on the relationship uh, between hypnosis and dissociation, as well as the impact of childhood disclosure of sexual abuse on adult functioning. More recently, he's initiated a project investigating the role of early adversity, trauma, and dissociation in the etiology and maintenance of hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, and he has a growing research interest in integrative psychedelic medicine. He's the former editor-in-chief of Trauma Psychology News. He serves on the board of directors at the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, where he's secretary of the executive committee, co-chair of the annual awards committee, and chair of the research special interest group. Clinically, John takes a relational psychodynamic approach, incorporating hypnosis, EMDR, ego state work, and the happening touch. John, I am so eager to hear your presentation and thank you so much for doing this. Take it away. Thanks, Dr. Ellis, for, for having me. And uh, yeah, it's so neat to be um, talking to TRIP students at NOVA. It's been eight or nine years um, since I was there. And uh, while I never did the, uh, you know, the clinical training, the practicum, uh, you know, trip, and I wish I did. I think you guys are, those that are, are you know, in the practicum now or considering it for the future. I think it's uh, such a great thing to have a life leg up. There's so much trauma. Even if you decide not to be a trauma specialist, you're going to invariably end up seeing a lot of traumatized people. And yeah, it's, it's a regret that I have not, um, you know, uh, getting started on it earlier. I, I feel relatively competent now, but, you know, that's something that you keep working on over the course of your career. So, um, I was introduced to TRIP uh, by Dr. Ellis. Um, uh, she encouraged me because I was kind of disenfranchised with the research and the you know things I would, was doing at the time. So she said, come, come check out the TRIP research team. And it was neat to get involved in some projects there. So, you know, all that to say, I'm excited to um, be talking to you guys. And thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to make things a little interactive, but it's a funny thing. I remember being um, a grad student and thinking like, oh my God, 20 minute presentation. Um, that's like an eternity. Uh, and I still get the jitters a little bit before talking. But last night as I was running things through, I was like, oh shit, I've got like two and a half, three hours of content. I need to like trim things and I want interaction. So I was hoping like to chat with you guys a little bit for a couple minutes to start, save time, some time to at the end. Um, but feel free to you know jump in if you have questions or comments throughout. Um, and I want to address them. Um, we may uh, just uh, uh, address some kind of briefly or whatever in the interest of covering a lot of ground though. So um, so I'm curious, that, and you don't have to turn your screen on if you don't want your screen on, but I was just wondering um, where people are at in terms of their uh, point in the training program. So how many how many first year students are here? Are there any first years? Okay, I see one and some people are popping up on the screen. Any other first years? Okay, there's another, so a couple, two, three first years. How many second years? Oh, four, four or five first years, wow. Um, how many second years? Let's see one. Okay, any third years? So one, two, three, fourth years. Okay. Any interns? Oh, oh cool. We've got an undergrad on the call too, Sophia Sassan. Awesome. And uh, I know we have one postdoc because Dr. Hubble is my postdoc and she's here with us. Thanks for being here, Jessica. Um, well, cool. That's great. And so before I jump in, uh, you may have seen what Dr. Ellis circulated, which is sort of this confusing thing where there are like two titles for the presentation. One's about drug use in dissociative individuals, myths and misunderstandings, and another's about psychedelics for shame, trauma, and dissociation. So not entirely unrelated topics, and that's because I have two upcoming uh, you know, workshops, one workshop and one forum, and I figured, well, hey, what a cool opportunity to try to cover material from um, both. So I'll try to find some way to have things kind of flow together in there. But um, I'm wondering as clinicians, um, aspiring clinicians, uh, clinicians in training that are working with trauma um, or are considering, you know, TRIP, um, what comes to mind when you guys think about uh, trauma and uh, drug use? So um, 
sort of uh, not, you know, psychoactive drugs, not prescription drugs, or even prescription drugs that are, you know, used for non-prescription purposes, recreational drugs, that would be the uh, the way to think of it. What do you guys think of? Anybody want to share their um, associations? No wrong answers. Um, I, I really, the self-medication hypothesis makes a lot of sense to me that, you know, people are using recreational drugs to, um, find some relief in a way of their symptoms, but then that can also maybe lead to some disconnect and, and in a way, uh, make dissociation worse. Um, you know, because you're so, instead of, I want to say like getting used to your trauma symptoms, you're disconnecting from them in a way. Wow. I love that answer. There's a lot, a lot to it to unpack there. And I, I, that makes a lot of sense. And I've definitely, you know, seen that myself with some of my clients where, um, they're trying to, they're trying to ameliorate their distress. They're trying to feel less agitated, or maybe they're trying to feel more things if they're kind of dissociated, but you know, there's that tricky relationship between anxiety and dissociation. And now I'm feeling more, but feeling's not always a good thing. And then you get more dissociation. So perhaps it starts in one place and it turns into something that's, that's maladaptive. Um, anybody else associations or things you think of? Um, I see somebody in the chat, uh, Sophia uh, uh, Gomez posted psilocybin and the work being conducted on patients with PTSD to help break traumatic cycles. Absolutely. I'm glad you bring that up. And that's something that we're going to come back to in the second uh, portion of the presentation, talking about some of that research. Um, anybody else want to share anything? Maybe they've come across in the news that they've observed themselves or um, you think is accurate about um, traumatized people and uh, these kind of substances, or maybe inaccurate. Okay. Um, oh, those that use recreational drugs are more likely to experience trauma. Yeah, that's uh, Alexis. Absolutely. So, um, and and what a complicated thing there too. Chicken or the egg, right? Um, you know, is it uh, that um, you know people who are highly traumatized are seeking some kind of relief to feel differently, and so they seek out the drugs? Is it that um, when people are under the acute effects of drugs or overcomes their resiliency, are they then more prone to becoming traumatized? And of course, these aren't like mutually ex exclusive, right? These things can um, can both be the case. So, well, thanks very much for sharing your thoughts with me, guys. And I'll um, jump into my slides now if I can figure out how to do this. She share screen. going to try to do this thing where I just do like presenter view, but I only want to share like a section like the actual slides. Let me see if I can figure that out. Okay. Can somebody let me know if they can see just the slide? Yeah, okay. it's not right. Thanks guys. So yeah, these are the two titles, Miss and Misunderstandings about drug use and dissociative individuals. And then Psychedelics for Trauma, Shame, Dissociation, Uncover, Discover, Connect, and Heal. And that latter one is going to be at this year's ISSTD. I'm going to put a shameless plug in for the conference uh, at, at the end. Um, there are a lot of neat uh, talks coming up, but this year is on um, uh, the power of healing, power of dignity. So um, populations that are uh, not, uh, that are underserved, um, haven't been identified, how to harness individuals' um, innate capacity to heal, um, and perhaps treatment methods that are not being addressed. So this is going to be a forum. So I'm sort of talking about my part, but I have two other presenters with me um, at that time. So what are we talking about today? Um, different misunderstandings people may have about traumatized, traumatized drug users, how people um, end up on a path where they end up, we could say, misusing substances. Some people would argue and say that there is such a thing as a responsible recreational um, drug use that doesn't cause impairment. We'll talk about something called hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, which you may have come across in, uh, briefly in your psychopathology or some kind of diagnostic class, um, but may not have talked much about it. It's often seen as a neurological condition, and um, that's sort of the end of the, the discussion. Um, but I, I would argue that there's something more there. We'll talk about um, a, a case that I treated that really inspired me to get more curious about um, the diagnosis, uh, the ideology, and sort of like the um, early life experiences of people that, that develop this condition. And then we'll talk later in the presentation about um, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, which is often abbreviated to PA, PT, or something like that, um, specifically for trauma dissociation. 
Um, it's worth noting that, you know, not everybody who engages in maladaptive drug use has some awful history of trauma and, and neglect. You know, you guys are probably familiar with this from some class. There's sort of these like two trajectories in terms of like parenting styles and um, yes, uh, you know, uh, neglectful parents, you know, uh, produced offspring, oftentimes they're disorganized or tend towards drug use, but also um, overindulgent permissive parents. Uh, um, it, it can happen there as well. So we're, we're more concerned here about the former rather than the latter. Um, although sometimes a, a child has both, right? One abusive parent and one indulgent parent. And you know, oftentimes this is, uh, you see this in people that eventually develop a bipolar disorder. So and it could be trauma there too. So we neither want to uh, demonize, um, you know, and moralize around drug use, um, but I, there's a lot of unbridled enthusiasm around psychedelic uh, um, interventions lately. So I think perhaps, you know, a nuanced um, understanding is, is, you know, is in order. And trying to encourage more compassion and curiosity towards quote unquote recreational drug users. Um, what motivates them towards use? What do they get out of it? Uh, why do they maintain um, use? Uh, rather than seeing as a, seeing them as a sort of having this a weakness of will or something like that. Um, later on, looking at HPPD, as they say, challenging the current conceptualization, or at least saying maybe we need to do more than just biological reductionism with it. Um, and as they say, getting to, on to psychedelics. So, so how do people come to, and perhaps this isn't people on the call, but how does maybe like the lay public or um, less trauma-informed clinicians, you know, um, come to have this sort of like very negativistic stance around people that use drugs with a trauma history. You know, certainly there's plenty of research establishing a comorbidity there. And um, I guess in thinking specifically about DID, because that's what this section of the material is, is for, um, presentation for uh, Healing Together, which is a DID conference up in Orlando in a couple of weeks uh, that Infinite Mind puts on. Um, but, you, you know, one of the criteria for DID there says it's not due to the direct physiological effects of a substance, which I think is like a good criteria. Um, but at least when I was uh, at Nova in grad school, I won't say the name to the professors, but I remember this conversation about, well, um, you know, it's kind of, you know, uncanny that all these people seem to have polychemical uh, uh, substance use uh, history there and stuff. And they, we think they've just, you know, the sort of gist was perhaps they've just scrambled their brains and that's that's uh, that's why they're having these symptoms. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of people uh, with complex PTSD and with dissociative disorders will have a you know, um, a history of some some drug use and maybe current use, but that doesn't sort of uh, um, disqualify from them from having uh, the uh, the other disorder. So, and there's certainly similarities between altered states um, of consciousness that people experience uh, when they're under the effect of drugs and dissociative states. If you guys are working with DID clients or even OSDD or DPDR, um, you'll you'll hear often about you know uh, times when they're sort of like on a, a fissure or like they're about to switch um, you know of uh, sort of visual abnormalities. Maybe everything takes like on like a, a sepia, sepia, however you pronounce that word, tint or something like that. Or uh, there are these sort of um, strange things that happen to their visual field. So what are some of these myths, these misconceptions? Well, one might be that, um, and this is sort of just like it's it's a way of conceptualizing it that some people say, well. Uh, these dissociative drug users, they're they're reckless, they're out of control, they're they're indulgent, or they're just avoiding um, working on their trauma. Um, you know, I know some 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 clinics or some uh, practitioners will say, okay, well, I don't we don't do trauma work or we don't do personality work until like the drug use is is under control. And yeah, there are some good reasons if a person's life is super chaotic and they can't show up to treatment. Um, that makes things that makes things difficult, but it, it tends to be a lot of moralizing. And I think just another way of, of looking at things. Um, what, what do psychoactive substances allow a person to, um, to access? Well, for some, uh, you know, and this depends on the individual and their history and also the, the drug in question, they may be hoping to feel less. They're completely overwhelmed um, by their immediate situation, their symptoms of anxiety, depression, whatever it is, they're trying to escape uh, um, haunting memories of their past. So they wanna feel less or think less about certain things. For some, and somebody on the call mentioned this before, you know, this relationship between dissociation and drug use, uh, some people uh, are really numbed out and they find like for the first time in their life, they're able to access certain emotional states. Um, so they want to uh, take advantage of that. Some people want to feel and think differently. And this kind of overlaps with the idea of experiencing healing from taking certain drugs. Now, it would be hard to make an argument that people are trying to like uh, work through their trauma or 
make fundamental positive changes in, in themselves if they're taking a bunch of fentanyl or something like that. You don't really hear about that, but um, certainly for um, hallucinogens, some people uh, have these sort of ideas in mind. And sometimes I think of it as, is the, is the intention, is the reason that's, that the person is engaging in the use, are they trying to um, get away from themselves or are they trying to get away, you could think, from parts of themselves? Are they trying to disconnect from that? or aspects of their history, or are they trying to embrace it? Are they trying to move closer and trying to find a way to integrate? What does this look like specifically in plural individuals? And I say, you know, I know um, there's this sort of uh, first person plural movement and uh, this idea that um, some people maybe um, have uh, different self states that are not necessarily dissociated and not um, uh, created by, by trauma itself. Uh, and so people have different ways of feeling about that, but talking about individuals that are highly traumatized and dissociative that have these distinct associated self-states. Um, some of them that, that, that engage in drug use find that uh, the use itself allows for selective access to some parts. It says to or by some parts. So, um, and you'll see a video clip of a client that I've seen for some time talking about the way she's used psilocybin, you know, specifically for this to get in touch with um, certain parts that are almost always out of reach. Um, now, selective access by some parts, that can be more problematic. I think of um, a woman who I've seen for quite a while. She's a, she's a therapist herself. Um, don't need lots of details. Um, it took a while for me to figure out it was a DID uh, sort of situation. And one of the times I did, and she came in and she was reeking of cigarettes and, and tequila, and she'd uh, been at um, a bar. She's not totally inebriated, but what was like jarring about that is um, she's like a very sort of puritanical uh, a church sort of person that's very uh, moralistic and, and looks down her nose and talks a certain way about people that, that uh, use any kind of substance that drink or smoke or anything um, like that. So um, over the course of treatment, this part showed up to treatment more and more. You know, we had to talk through, you know, not coming to session after drinking and things like that. But it was an interesting sign. Sometimes you'd smell the cigarettes and sometimes you wouldn't. You see it's very distinct ways of being, not that cigarettes, but I guess cigarettes could be used to access a, a certain part, but anyway. Um, so there are concerns though about uh, parts using a certain substance to, um, to, to contain certain feelings or, you know, so if you think about like uh, people maybe that are abusing um, anxiety medications or, or opiates not to feel things. Also interestingly, say punishing some parts, how would that work? Well, um, I don't know if people are familiar with uh, the abbreviation RAMCOA, which is a uh, ritualized abuse, mind control, and organized abuse, but uh, individuals that have been in these um, really bizarre abusive situations that have, uh, you know, where drugs have been used um, while they're being harmed in certain ways. Um, sometimes a person sort of develops a, a perpetrator interject, they internalize a version of the person that's, that's harmed them, and so it's possible, as bizarre as it may sound, that uh, they may have a self-defeating part, you could think of it like that, that comes to the front um, and causes all kinds of uh, chaos in their life and punishes them um, because it's been programmed or conditioned into them. So, but it's important to know how different parts feel about the substance. I think that's like bottom line. You're trying to, anytime you're working with a CPTSD with a lot of dissociation, a dissociative disorder, um, you want a person to be you know, aware of, conscious of what they're doing, across time and to uh, to feel, a, well, not to feel a consistent way about it, but for parts to have buy-in. So, and if a person's considering psychedelic therapy, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, they may have parts of them that are sort of, uh, you know, more front facing, that have been around for a long time, that are responsible, that uh, are, are capable of, 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 uh, of you know, what, what's involved in a difficult psychedelic experience, but they may have younger parts that don't know anything about it, that are very frightened about the idea. So, you know, um, that's one thing to to consider, uh, you know, is really taking some time to explore with your client. Not that you're giving a thumbs up or saying, yeah, go go use these, uh, go into psychedelic treatment or use these drugs, but really making sure that parts of them are all consenting and aware of uh, what's going on. And um, if they need to be uh, protected in some way, you know, uh, to go somewhere else inside uh, to be sheltered during that experience, that would be a good thing to do. So another misunderstanding here is that some people would say these dissociative drug users engage in drug use. So um, their struggles related to drugs are consequences of their choices. So basically it's like, well, hey, you choose to, chose to do this. So, um, you know, toughen up buttercup. You know, if, if you don't like it, maybe you shouldn't have used the drugs. 
And, you know, there are some problems with this. Uh, as I've mentioned before, it's not always the case that individuals are introduced to drugs um, and make a choice to do them. Um, at times, uh, they're very much interwoven into the abuse and that can start quite young um, in life. And to complicate things work, uh, even more, they're not always conscious of when that started. Um, they're not always conscious of the abuse, right? So they're not always conscious of um, that they were um, under the effects of, of, of drugs at a young age. Uh, so it makes things a little tricky. I'll, there's a quote here from Jewel Jones, is a person with lived experience uh, of dissociation. She is a therapist herself, and uh, she is uh, in the process of writing a book, and she was very much okay with me um, including this and um, wanted me to uh, not mask her identity, identity, but to identify her. So she said her personal experience as an EOEA survivor that's uh, um, organized abuse, extreme organized abuse, is that drugs, different types were used at different times, made it possible for me to survive more extreme abuse, confused and delayed me believing what I recalled, made me quieter and more obedient during the abuse and filming, and even heightened libido, so I quote unquote perform better. I do believe that it worked alongside the dissociation. Um, every word I've written here has taken decades of hard work, denial, terror, shame, horror, et cetera, hard earned. On the whole, less drugs were used over time until newer, harder things were demanded of me Then a new drug was introduced. So um, so here we have a much uh, much different account than um, as contrasted to this sort of idea that some people may hold of, well, these are people that are just indulgent and they're allowed for a good time or something like that. And so sometimes drug use continues uh, because the memories uh, of the abuse are, are dissociated, but the drug use may continue uh, to the point where um, it's been sort of not forgotten, but yeah, disconnected, dissociated, repressed, you know, the origin of how this all started. I'm going to share with you guys a video clip of a client that I've seen for six years talking about some of her abuse and both um, because I think it's good to talk about the consent process because uh, it's important here and it's unique if you're working with a dissociative person and they're your client and they're sharing things, um, but also because it's sort of, you know, research ethics and um, important part of methods that uh, she was, let's see. So when I brought it up to her and I've done this with a couple other people that I'm not playing the clips today for time's sake, um, but I brought it up kind of like obliquely, you know, because she's interested in research, she's starting grad school herself. Um, and said, you know, this is a, a project that I'm, I'm up to lately. If you happen to know of anybody that would be interested um, in uh, being interviewed or submitting just text, it could be a video, it could be audio, it could be written, it could be completely masked their identity. They could, you know, uh, just let me know. So I didn't ask her directly, you know, and she brought it up herself then a couple of weeks later. And I said, okay, well, I still want you to think about this um, and I'll email you about it. And you, you're, you're welcome to change your mind at any time, including after you send me whatever you send me. So. Um, and after she sent it to me, I then offered to uh, compensate her $100 for her time. The reason I didn't do that is you don't want to place, she's not very affluent, and I wouldn't want to place any additional pressure on her. So I guess it's you have to consider the pressure is, uh, that the person may experience to want to please you. Oftentimes, these are people who um, their will doesn't matter, or they're sort of made to feel like they have to consent or agree to things, even if they're not wanting to agree to things. So probably just too much detail here, but I guess I wanted you guys to, to, to know that she was given multiple opportunities to change her time, to have her identity masked, but she does um, online advocacy and very, is very open about her experiences and uh, you know lived experiences and identity. So um, she was okay with it. So let me go ahead and get out of here. And in a uh, nice uh, dissociative process, she sent me like three different fragments that kind of overlapped of a video clip. So um, I'm going to play two of them. They're like a little bit, uh, you know, uh, staggered or something there, but yeah, I think you'll get the gist. Do you guys see like a full video clip or image of her? Okay. So her name's Winter. We've seen each other for six years. She's in the maintenance stage of therapy where we see each other once or twice a month. It was twice a week, um, but there's a very long history of uh, um, abuse, uh, starting at a young age, and then she was kidnapped and confined for part of her adult life in her 20s. Um, anyway, I'll let her talk. I'm just going to play for a minute. Can you guys hear this? So my introduction to psychoactive substances was really young. I was introduced to them by my father, who was my primary abuser growing up. He used mostly um, psychoactive substances that would be considered like downers, so suppressants of the nervous system. Um, and these were used to 
essentially sedate me during sexual abuse. So the downers were the primary form used on me very young. Um, it started to change as I became older and I believe he was trying to get me addicted to more upper type psychoactive substances, things like ecstasy, cocaine. Uh, this switch also occurred due to my own request at the time uh, because I had become incredibly fearful of not waking up after high doses of sedatives. Um, so I desired something that would still somewhat take me out of the experience or make it not hurt as bad or be as painful and still offer some level of uh, dissociation essentially to what I was going through. So my parents became separated when I had turned 16. And for a while, I had no involvement with my father about until 18 years of age. During that time from 16 to 18, I had a very strong dependency on alcohol. Um, this dependency continued in, well into my mid-20s. Um, and then just as I became an adult into my mid-20s, um, and then just as I became an adult and was able to find access to different substances, I used those substances to try to um, self-medicate and cope with the experiences that I had been through. And also, I was quite already addicted to alcohol. And alcohol was definitely the preferred substance for me um, because it typically helped me get through my work day without being reactive. I worked in a very bad part of town and I was around certain types of individuals that would often trigger me. And I found that constantly under the influence of alcohol, I was able to maintain my composure. I also used it really heavily to be able to sleep at night. And while I occasionally used marijuana in my early 20s, I largely stayed away from it. It wasn't until my mid-20s when I got it to start using it medicinally because of some chronic health issues that I noticed it had a very facilitative effect on me. Um, I was able, to, it was able to put me in a state where I felt like I could connect with myself internally in a way that uh, a lot of other drugs I noticed caused like a disconnect. And after exploring with marijuana and finding it facilitating to my healing, I got interested in other substances. Um, the main substance being psilocybin, so magic mushrooms, um, which I am almost for certain I was not given at all when I was younger. This was something that I had discovered, you know, once I had gotten older and decided that I was curious. Um, at first, I partook in it in a way where I was just doing a lot to try to get the maximum experience that I could out of it. Um, and I will say tripping on magic mushrooms had some pretty transformative experiences using psilocybin. Uh, at the higher dosages, it really helped connect me to parts of myself that were so far out of my reach most of the time. Um, and then I started microdosing. And that is where I had found the most help in it for me as a dissociative person who experiences almost for most of my life, I didn't, I wasn't here. Like I felt, I didn't know what it meant to feel here. And using psilocybin helped me to feel here and be connected to the world around me in a way that felt um, beautiful and significant. And in those moments of being able to be connected to the things around me, I was also able to connect with myself. Um, and I really wish people understood that 
in the past, I did use psychoactive substances to cope with the trauma that I had experienced and the symptoms that I was having because of that trauma. Um, now I don't use these substances to cope anymore. I am using them to facilitate in my growth and my healing as a person. And it, what it really comes down to for me is having the autonomy to be able to use these things as tools for me to help me instead of how they were used in my past, which was as tools to hurt me and harm me, to keep me um, complacent or, you know, out of the experience so that things could be done to me that I didn't want done to me. And while I do believe uh, certain psychoactive substances have a, a high capacity for harm, I also believe they have a high capacity for healing. And for me, as a person who was extremely traumatized and developed a very intense dissociative disorder, once I started to be able to use these tools with intent for healing instead of intent for separating myself from my past, it opened doors for me that would have been so deeply troubling to just open by themselves completely through therapy alone. Um, so I really hope that in the future, people can understand that the main component to being able to feel in control is having the autonomy, the choice to be able to use these substances as tools for healing. And I have a hope that one day people do not view um, psychoactive substances in such a black and white manner um, because it's really so much more complex than what most people can perceive, especially for individuals like myself who, who have the lived experiences that I lived through because I lived a, in a world that most people will never experience. So I hope that people understand that giving a survivor the autonomy to make these very important decisions for themselves um, and letting them choose how they facilitate in their growth and their healing is the most important aspect to getting better. Okay. I was really grateful to her for being willing to um, to record this and allow us to to, to use it. And uh, um, I didn't even think of this. You know, I offered, as I say, to to compensate her. And I, um, you know, given her history, the idea she said the idea of of taking money for sharing something like this felt uh, dirty or wrong to her. And I said, oh gosh, I didn't even think about that. But would you let me donate uh, something? So she chose ISSTD as a, a charity I could donate to, which is really nice of her. And, um, any any comments about this or anything else so far before we move forward? I think it was great that she was that she distinguished between like the, that she was able to tell us like you know when you use when you use drugs with this intent maybe it's it it doesn't facilitate you know growth and healing from traumatic experiences but if you use it with this intent like it actually it can really like be a big aid in healing from trauma and that was amazing to me like how she cuz yeah that's such a fine line and she's able to like differentiate between those two things. And I think that's 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 really cool. Thanks so much for sharing your observations, Luca. Yeah. Um, and I uh, really like what she said about, you know, autonomy, you know, autonomy to change or be in control of your state of consciousness, how powerful that can be. And, um, you know, uh, I don't think that this is sort of like a means that anybody, to, despite what stage they are in their healing, should just jump in the deep end with psychedelics. Um, but it's a tricky thing, you know, what, what position are we in as a therapist to say, oh, I think you're at a good place or not a good place. 
uh, to do this. And, you know, um, so there are, you know, there are considerations there. Um, okay, any other thoughts before we move on? Looks like Abigail unmuted. Yes, me, Sophia. Sophia, okay, thanks. So I found very interesting how he explained how he used, um, for example, psilocybin to heal, because I feel like there's a lot of misconception on the use of drugs and it's like I don't want to like say that all drugs are good and you should go and do drugs but I, I do feel that there's drugs and there's quantity like quantities of drugs that can help someone in the and if that was his way to heal her way to heal sorry mm -hmm. I think that I totally agree that we as a therapist and she has a testimony. We should break that misconception of the misuse of drugs. So I love that from her. And I think that it's super strong for her to come here and say their story and in a way don't feel ashamed because that doesn't define a person. So I I really feel like super touched and inspired. Thanks for sharing your perspective. And I agree, she's such a impressive person overall. Of course, I'm biased, <laughs> but uh, I've known her for a while. But um, yeah, uh, I think sometimes these these uh, medications, these drugs, these substances, you can think of them as though they're like a scalpel, right? And so like uh, they have the potential to excise something, to, to remove something cancer so a person can live and thrive, but you know, um, in, in the wrong hands or used in a clumsy way, uh, they can cause all kinds of tissue damage or, or death or something. So um, did anybody else want to share? It looks like Audrey put something in the chat that was amazing to hear firsthand, the amount of insight she has from her experience, so valuable and it's very informative and inspiring. Um, anybody else want to say anything before we go on? Amanda? I was going to say, it, I found it really helpful to kind of hear the nuanced experiences that she was having, like with different substances and how it either helped her to like numb out or connect because it's things that I feel like we might maybe expect but I feel like the detail of it there were some things that I didn't really put together so I found it helpful to hear her take on that for sure it's one thing to read you know a research article of somebody's theory on something it's another thing for somebody with actual lived experience to talk about their personal um, encounters with it. And um, uh, yeah, see another hand, Bram. I really liked that she was talking about how the choice to be able to use the psilocybin as a form of empowerment because she can use a substance for herself and her own um, growth to healing uh, compared to when it was like used against her to keep her complacent. Like I really liked how she that into words for sure thanks for your for your observations there okay let's uh let's stick on but uh, feel free to, to to jump in along the way anybody i'm gonna go screen share portion okay so there's also this idea, and I remember hearing this in grad school, that, uh, you know, enough drug use will cause a dissociative disorder. Um, and I used to really be dubious of that. I now think we, sometimes, maybe. Um, certainly, there is uh, research that suggests, wait, what is going on here? Why am I? Oh, okay. Wrong slide. Um, so, yeah, it is true that, you know, if you look at people who are developing dissociative symptoms after um, taking a substance, uh, there seems to be some some trauma uh, history there, and we do know that from uh, this is a review um, from Mar Martinotti and colleagues there that look at the past you know sixty years or so of hallucinogen persisting perception disorder research. More about the criteria for that in a minute, um, but they find that um, depersonalization and derealization are, are commonly endorsed by people, um, although nobody's really making any sort of like theory about that, why that is, or what that what that means. Um, it's just sort of noted as interesting comorbidities or something like that. Um, studies of, of HPPD as a condition don't investigate the impact of early adversity trauma. They don't assess for any current symptoms of, of, of PTSD. Um, it's a very small literature, uh, I should say, um, because at least to this point, it's sort of portrayed as a, a rare disorder, but I don't know 
uh, you may think differently in, in a minute here. <clears throat> so what is HPPD? Well, it was first described in the literature in uh, 1954, and it's a condition where an individual who's taken a, a mind-altering substance continues to experience these false sensory perceptions, hallucinations, oftentimes visual, um, long after the substance is out of their body. Uh, 70 years of literature, only a handful of articles out there, condition made it into the DSM-3R as post-hallucinogen perception disorder, and in the 4TR was changed to hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, friends flashbacks. Um, so flashbacks as a term in this context was first uh, used by Horowitz in 1969, um, and they're most often visual phenomena. Interestingly, we also refer to flashbacks, as you know, in PTSD, uh, and there are some important similarities there. It's most commonly reported in LSD use, uh, which is a pretty strong hallucinogen. It's long lasting, uh, but can also occur in a host of other sort of, uh, you know, taking a host of other different kinds of drugs. And interestingly, um, the mechanism of action of these drugs is, is quite different. But the sequelae, the, uh, the, you know, the lingering flashbacks tend to be pretty similar. Most of the literature says that it's of low prevalence, 4 to 5% of LSD users, but up to 50% of polydrug users. And as we mentioned a little bit earlier, um, what do we know about polydrug uh, users? They're disproportionately um, traumatized people. There are, I don't think it's broken out like this in like the, um, the DSM or the ICD-10, but in the literature, it's considered that there are two types here. So type one is short-term, um, lasts maybe a few weeks or a few months, um, and people by and large are not annoyed by these these uh, these these phenomena when they happen. In fact, uh, when you talk to them, say, "Hey, it's kind of cool. It's like a free trip. Every once in a while, I get some of those visuals that come back or whatever." And, um, type two HPPD, though, uh, quite a different animal where the course is quite prolonged. We're talking months, years, decades. New shot and colleagues talk about a case they've treated with uh, benzodiazepines for some twenty five years, and it's really they're just trying to keep the person to maintain some level of, of functioning. So, uh, and importantly, you know, is, is, is distress here. So um, not only are they having uh, recurring hallucinations come back to them, but there tends to be um, intense uh, discomfort, uh, panic, even to the point of, of, of terror. As I say, there are a number of comorbidities that have been noted. Um, including depersonalization and derealization, but nobody's really looked at um, history of, of, of trauma. It's known that certain lighting conditions can make this worse, sleep deprivation or stress. Interesting, sleep deprivation or stress makes a lot of our traumatized clients uh, struggle more. So here are some, you say, well, what are people seeing? I don't know how many people have, have taken uh, a hallucinogen, uh, so this may or may not be familiar to you. So uh, there can be these uh, geometric shapes or patterns that they tend to be semi-translucent. They're superimposed on uh, the visual field. Sometimes they're discrete static shapes. Sometimes they're patterns that kind of undulate and the borders can either be clear, or change with movement. Um, false perceptions of movement. Uh, oftentimes this is sort of out in the periphery of the visual field. That's uh, one of the most reported uh, symptoms. And you can imagine this would be uh, pretty distressing to try to navigate your surroundings, trying to drive a car and seeing things uh, in, in the periphery. They tend not to be like discrete objects, but just movements. It, it seems like there's movement there. Flashes of color could be a, um, a single color or rapidly or gradually alternating between a few. Could be just a little bit of the visual field. Could be like a single object. Could be um, larger areas or the entire visual field. Vibrant color sounds nice, but it can be quite distracting. Imagine trying to, like, say, work like an, I don't know, graphic design or some kind of visual arts. And um, it's important that you be able to, like, have a similar impression of, of color as, as others. Images like this may look familiar from, like, your intro to psychology or, um, I don't know, what would it be, like, perception text or something like that, after images where you stare at, uh, at a very saturated image for long enough and you, you fatigue, you know, or, you know, your sensory uh, receptors habituate in your eyes. And then if you shift, you see it. Um, you have to cut the up, a polar opposite color, um, but these are these are happening um, fairly often and not after staring for a long time. They're just kind of popping up, photo negative. Uh, trailing images, sometimes called tracers, may be enjoyable during the immediate experience, but again, uh, can make life difficult to unbearable. Um, seeing multiple iterations of, of an object that's in space in front of you when you're trying to move around in space. Illuminated objects, um, halos around objects, 
want to mention some of these, especially these uh, next few uh, may sound familiar from organic conditions, um, neurological conditions. So, you know, it's important to do differential diagnosis, you know, get a, a neuro, 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 neurologist involved, perhaps. Um, uh, and uh, these things can be intensified by stress. It's really when you get the combination of these things, because not all of these like occur with migraine or other neurological conditions. Um, visual snow. So people describe things as looking fuzzy or grainy in nature. Oftentimes it comes and goes, um, but it can be quite intense and make it difficult to, to move around to, to figure out what you're looking at or um, if a degree of precision is required when a person's looking at things. Um, again, common in some other neurological conditions, but very common in PTSD. Same thing with floaters in the visual field, these semi-translucent things that come and go. Um, the come and go thing is uh, an important aspect. And um, most people have probably heard of Alice in Wonderland syndrome, right? So micropsia and macropsia, um, common in our dissociative patients, things uh, start to get very small or things start to get very, very large. Um, and this affects the greatest number of HPPD individuals, about 70%. So most articles um, on this condition are published in neurology, psychology, and ophthalmology. Um, journals, there are some, some theories um, in terms of underlying mechanisms of action, whether it's chronic disinhibition of visual processors, uh, whether it's something to do with cortical serotonergic inhibition, GABA circuits, um, or impairment of the lateral geniculate nucleus. Um, so nice to have these theories about what's, what's happening in uh, the brain, but there's not much out there other than what Holland and Passy have written. It's really interested in like, you know, phenomenologically what's going on, the subjective world of the of the individual, how they're experiencing things. And so um, so this model's more to do with the maintenance or exacerbation of the symptoms, but I found it intriguing because they suggest that cues can be triggered, um, intensification of symptoms, especially when there's ego weakness. So obviously that sounds a little bit psychoanalytic, um, but if you're thinking of your vulnerability being overcome, uh, you know, in certain moments they talk about, it's very integrative. They're talking about state dependent memory, how certain things can become triggers um, in the outer world, or maybe you're just sensitized to um, unusual things in your visual field, um, and that can bring back the sort of trip or the experience again. Because it's treated as a neurological condition, um, common treatment involves medication, reducing activities that aggravate symptoms, and there's very little that talks about, nothing really that I could find that talks about psychotherapy other than, um, you know, supportive you know, suggesting lifestyle choices, you know, avoid delighting conditions, uh, try to reduce your stress, try not to do any more drugs. Maybe those are all good, helpful suggestions, but there's nothing to really sort of like, okay, how do we address um, what you're experiencing um, in, you know, in the moment and understand it, like analyze it, understand where, you know, why it's happening to you. So this is a, a case that um, spurred me to become more interested in HPPD. I'll call her Casey and I've changed some relevant details um, about her case, but She's in her early mid twenties when she came in and she'd had a really tough, we'd say difficult psychedelic experience. She'd say bad trip, um, followed by over a year of hallucinations that came back and we came along with anxiety and pervasive sense of mistrust. Um, the, the, during the trip itself, she'd taken a, uh, a couple hits of acid LSD, um, and was with her boyfriend and some friends. And the, the gist of it was that they were, um, in cahoots with the devil and they were going to try to murder her. Uh, and it reached the point in, um, you know, the uh, the trip where they were doing things to her body and she died. Um, but she didn't die. Thankfully, she lived, but she was very tortured by um, this experience and um, a sense of mistrust and anxiety that came along with it. Interestingly, this case, you know, she came in, this was the focus of treatment. Um, but when I, you know, did my spiel about, you know, trying to gather information about developmental history and childhood, she's like, I really can't remember much of my childhood. I know it was taken um, by... Uh, child protective services when I was eight or nine. I don't remember much, but like before then. So, <clears throat> so I sold her on EMDR as a treatment. Um, and uh, she wasn't, she lived kind of far away was one thing. And she's kind of inconsistent with showing up was another. So I said, okay, what if we do an extended EMDR session? We'll go all the way through the trip and get you some relief. Um, and this did lead to uh, retrieval of the sequence of events before it was just sort of like little blips and pieces, but she was able to go all the way back through the trip, remember lots of things that happened, um, experience a lot of the the, the, the terror, the panic, um, that eventually reduced and reduced. And importantly, 
uh, this betrayal by an attachment figure who was her boyfriend seemed to be very prominent, even though uh, she was feeling some ambivalence about staying in the relationship, but he had not done anything to like sort of like cheat on her or do things to like lose trust before that. So it was, really seemed to be produced by the, the trip. So um, interestingly, she was the uh, calm at the end of processing, but she was crying a lot. And that was remarkable because um, we'd only seen each other a few times, but she said she doesn't really cry. She doesn't remember crying at all. So the fact that she was able to connect with emotion was important. And at follow-up a week later, she said she was, uh, when well, the symptoms were still coming on, she wasn't very much bothered by them, didn't have that sort of intense panic. And a month later, uh, she said it was sort of a distant memory. Um, and it was at that point we started uh, being able to access and work through memories of what her father had done to her that was violent at a young age. So uh, you can think of it as sort of, um, well, I, I don't know how you think of it. I, I think of it as sort of like it's a, a screen memory in a sense. I mean, a memory of a trip, it's still a, a memory of something that happened, this delusional thing that happened. Um, but uh, what happened thematically was, you know, betrayal and physical harm happened to her. And while that wasn't the case, so to speak, in, in the outer world, um, she had experienced that before. Uh, and so when she was able to go through that, that led to access to um, instances where that was the case when she was younger. That makes sense. So uh, why does this matter? Well, it's notable that a lot of dissociative individuals report occasional hallucinations, even ones that do not use uh, you know, substances. Perhaps some of these type 2 HPPD cases constitute a complex trauma response would be my, my idea. Um, and maybe working through some of these cases, they, if they respond favorably to established methods of, of working with, with psychological trauma, it, perhaps there's some hope in that. It could just be a fluke. It could be this one person though, right? Um, but because I'm curious about that, I said, well, how early, how prevalent are early trauma and dissociation in HPPD? Because again, that data is not out there. And so I developed a pilot study a few months ago to try to learn more. And this is super small scale. so. Um, everything should be taken with a, with a grain of salt. Um, uh, uh, interested in basic demographic information, how they learned of the diagnosis. Um, I gathered a sample of 12 participants online because it looks like they're interesting results. I'm going to um, do something a bit bigger, try to get more participants. Had them complete a symptom checklist, um, uh, the current level of distress in the past month and the highest in the past month. They did the DES2, which I'm sure you guys know. Uh, the PTSD checklist, um, unconventional use of the PTSD quick screener here. That's just like the five question measure. I asked them to try it if they could to reflect back on like a month before they took the hallucinogenic question where they had that difficult experience and try to estimate where they were at. Um, and I also had them complete the, the ACEs scale. So this was <clears throat> online support uh, forums I used to recruit and I offered people $25 gift cards in exchange for 30 to 45 minutes of their time. And after I received like an onslaught of emails that all sounded very similar in the text, um, I started asking for a five to 10 minute interview to assure that they uh, actually met criteria and it wasn't the same person um, repeatedly participating. And about 80% of the people who reached out did not respond when I asked for an interview. So it sort of leads me to believe, okay, a lot of these people were just trying to get the gift card. It's a tough situation to work around. <clears throat> so those measures I talked about, put them into a 76 question um, survey monkey form. Survey monkey is nice. It gives you these stats. So it took people on average 22 minutes to work their way through it. 12 people, average age was about 30 there with a standard deviation of five two thirds male, um, and it was an international sample because it's an online study. So interestingly, the majority of the people that responded, again, just 12, so we can't really make much of this, but uh, the majority had used LSD. Synthetic cannabis is, is, is a big issue. There are these uh, all these sort of analogs of classical psychedelics that are being sprayed on plant matter. Uh, so people don't really know what they've taken. Um, DMT, very strong uh, psychedelic. So nutmeg was interesting. I didn't realize this. Apparently, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you take a couple of teaspoons of nutmeg um, and swallow it, you'll have a pretty strong experience after you get over a bunch of vomiting. So I think I'll stick with you know pumpkin pie and, and, and cookies within it. But there was a range of how long people had had these symptoms, anywhere from five months to six years. Um, it's quite a bit of self-diagnosis. I, I think I trust that in this case. I don't always trust self-diagnosis, but this is a relatively obscure condition. It's hard to imagine like what the secondary gain is around around it. Um, you know, 
and people, uh, others had been prescribed by psychiatrists, psychologists. So here's some results. I need to meet with a stats person because that's not my forte, um, but I just wanted to put the distributions up here and we can talk a little bit about it. So here are DES scores on the DS. The, the cutoff is 30 for indicative of a dissociative disorder and 20 to 30 suggests possible PTSD. So more than half the sample was above 20 and a quarter was above 30, which seemed remarkable. Here's the PCL5, 20 item PTSD screener. Recommended cutoff varies. You see it anywhere from 31 to 38. If we choose the more liberal cutoff, seven out of 12 or 58% endorse symptoms consistent with PTSD. And this is diffuse probably to the point of meaninglessness. This is um, asking them to reflect back a month before the trip for that quick measure. Um, so nobody scored a five, 25% scored four. So perhaps there was trauma, pre-morbid pre trauma. But I think the ACEs is a better uh, way of, of trying to ascertain that. So I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with the ACEs, right? This uh, measure 10 different things from a person's childhood that might affect them, developed by Kaiser Permanente, this measure to look at the effects of early difficult experiences um, and later uh, uh, physical health and mental health symptoms. So things like uh, abuse, different forms of abuse, um, neglect, parent was in prison, parent was using drugs, lived in a hostile neighborhood, these kind of things. So I found this to be pretty remarkable. Um, I don't remember what the average ACEs score is. It's like 1.6 or 1.7, something under two. Uh, but the average score here is nearly double that and more of the sample than half of the sample had a score of four or more, indicating a higher risk of developing a lot of conditions. So 58% with an ACEs score of four, or above, and that compares to 13% in the general population. So really small scale study, but seems like warrants some further investigation, I think. So what can we say? Bearing in mind it's a pilot study, there's not enough data to make definitive assertions. Um, seems like individuals experiencing HPPD may have a higher likelihood of a comorbid or secondary PTSD or premorbid PTSD. Um, in the small sample, higher frequency of dissociative experiences, higher ACEs scores. Um, so if if this is valid or suggests anything, um, perhaps in type two HPPD, uh, which was everybody in the sample because it had been more than a number of months, um, some notable percentage might be experiencing the impact of cumulative trauma um, exposed by a mind opening, or you could say anti-dissociative uh, effect of a psychedelic substance. As they say, small sample size, self-diagnosis is an issue. Um, so why, why does this matter though? Isn't this pretty obscure? Well, one year prevalence of PTSD in the U S is somewhere in that range, two and a half to 9% and 58% of this sample endorsed symptomatology consistent with PTSD. So 4% of LSD users develop HPPD in their lifetime. And there are about 20 million people in the U S who have used LSD. That means as many as 800,000 people have symptoms of HPPD, interestingly, um, and psychedelic medicine, we're just like at a, a boom period right now, right? So lots of people are taking psychedelics. And while rates of um, adverse experiences when people are in controlled conditions or supportive therapy with the psychedelics are lower, they're still, they're still there. Um, so I think we're going to see more cases going forward. So it's been treated as a neurological condition, and it's not to say that uh, it, the brain isn't being impacted. Um, but it's possible the treatment focusing on psychological trauma could help to reduce some of the suffering in some portion of these people. Okay. So I just want to, let me see here, how do I stop? Okay, before I jump forward into like another section, um, let's see, any, 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 any thoughts or comments here? Okay. So I think this builds in a direction. It's not like so much a cautionary tale about, um, well, maybe people shouldn't use psychedelics or, or traumatize people, um, you know, um, but perhaps uh, people who are traumatized, uh, more comes to the surface if they take certain, certain um, mind altering substances. And uh, perhaps that should also be considered in how um, the, the experiences when people take psychedelics for, for therapeutic purposes could be structured or could be trauma informed. So I, I don't want to show you guys a, a brief clip, and this is kind of an aside, but so if we think that a lot of people are developing this condition, or a part of it is that they're having a really unpleasant, a bad or challenging trip um, experience, um, 
how can you be supportive? You know, it's possible that one of your clients might contact you if they're in the midst of one of these experiences or might come in shortly thereafter the next day or something and still be kind of reeling. And, oh my gosh. So this is a video produced by just seven or eight minutes produced by MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies um, back in 2008. And it was used to um, give first responders uh, who are going to be at a large uh, uh, festival, an idea of how to help people that were experiencing uh, an unpleasant psychedelic experience. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and screen share on this. Okay, can people see the video here? Hopefully. I'm just gonna jump it forward a little bit here. Hi, I'm Dr. Ingrid Pope. Experience while under the influence of a psychedelic drug and demonstrate some general principles on when and how emotional support could best be given. <laughs> Oh, look at Jill's over there. He's looking a little out of sorts. Do you have any idea what's up with him right now? Well, Donald told me that they each took about two hits of acid a couple of hours ago, but Donald went for a walk with some friends, and Jason's just here by himself. What Jason is experiencing is not just limited to what he is seeing and hearing. It is reaching the deepest levels of his mind. Things usually taken for granted that time, self-identity, and any other aspect of reality can be as unusual as what he is seeing and hearing. Even though most psychedelic difficulties are psychological, not physical, if someone has taken a psychedelic drug and is having a difficult experience, a helper should first assess is the person concerned about his or her physical safety if there is any doubt about physical safety, a helper should call 911. If not, try to find out some basic information. What drug does the person think he or she took? How much of the drug does the person recall taking? How long ago does the person recall taking the drug? Is the person on any other medications or drugs, including alcohol? For further background information about drugs and drug combinations, the website www.arrowwood.org has potentially useful information. How are you feeling? Um, I feel like I feel like I'm going insane right now a little bit. I feel like I need to get out of here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's hard for me to, to talk right now. It's fine. Do you feel physically okay? Yeah. Yeah. Physically, I feel fine. But the rest of me feels like it's being sucked into some sort of vortex or something. Are you tripping right now? Yeah. Yeah, I sure am. I'm tripping my face off. Someone with the opportunity to help someone having a difficult psychedelic experience should keep a few basic principles in mind. If the person is not reporting physical danger, the first thing to do is to create a safe space. A safe space can be created anywhere, but it is best to find a place that is quiet, warm, and comfortable. A good phrase to remember is sitting, not guiding. Sit with the person, but do not lead the person away from his or her experience. Let your presence communicate safety and caring and allow the content of the person's experience to guide any questions you ask or comments you make. If the person is in distress, 
you may be able to help him or her to explore whatever experiences or issues are being encountered. Staying calm will make it easier to create a trusting environment. This means that you can be helpful just by sitting with someone with a supportive and friendly presence. What's happening when you close your eyes? Um, I, I'm seeing all these strange shapes and colors swirling into a vortex, but it's not so much like, it's not so much like I'm seeing it. It's like a uh, part of it. I can't control it. I can't relax. I don't know how. I can't, I don't know how. I don't know how. I can't control it. I'm, I can't even control it and I'm getting sucked in. Just go with it. We're in a safe place now. Talk through, don't talk down. That is, help the person talk through what's happening rather than trying to find some magic words to bring the person down from the experience. Many experts believe that it is best to give the person the space to work through his or her problems rather than the common practice of trying to distract the person from them. Try to help the person connect with what he or she is feeling and facilitate them in their own journey by promoting trust and security. Since you're going to be tripping for a few more hours, maybe you could take this opportunity to like explore what's happening to you. Don't fight your experience. Just trust that it's happening for an important reason. Difficult is not necessarily bad. It is important to allow someone on psychedelics to explore all emotions, not just happy or fun ones. Experiences with longer lasting negative consequences are more likely to occur when a person resists confronting his or her difficult emotions and tries to escape from them. Wow. That was incredible. That was incredible. Not painful with moments of peace and clarity. And I, I feel I, I definitely feel a lot a lot less crazy when I'm not trying so hard to to control everything. In this video we hope Okay. So yeah if if anybody's done any training in um psychosensory um focused approaches, you know, somatic experiencing or um, EMDR, things like that. Some of that um, not controlling, letting go, trusting, going with it um, can be so important when a person's trying to have an embodied experience and, and connect things and make sense of them. So um, yeah, I just thought I'd share that. Go back to share the other screen. Whoa. Get this song and dance figured out just in time to be done with the presentation. I think there we go. Okay, so just a bit about um, the history of psychedelic um, legality and uh, psychedelic assisted therapy in, th in this country, in this culture. It's an interesting book called Acid Dreams by Lee and Schlein that was based on um, largely on declassified CIA documents that. Uh, Freedom of uh, Information Act released from 1976 released. And so, um, you know, which looked into the role of the CIA, Army Intelligence and Academia um, in studying a lot of these, these substances. Um, and you can really think of the trajectory of psychedelics in the country propelled by two forces and sometimes them being at odds and sometimes overlapping. Um, those who were hoping to um, find ways to heal the psyche and to understand the mind. Uh, and those that were hoping to use them to uh, fracture the mind, so more psychedelic versus psychomimetic um, models. And um, for people that don't know this or haven't heard of it, um, this sounds kind of tinfoil hat, but it's well, you know, researched and documented. Um, Project Paperclip after World War II, sure the Nuremberg trials, uh, a lot of uh, good things were done to persecute and, and deal with, uh, you know, Nazi scientists. But a large number of them were imported by the CIA and U.S. Uh, intelligence to work for them and conduct pretty horrific studies. 
um, including studies of LSD, MDMA. Uh, really, the CIA and Army intelligence were in uh, search of a truth serum, something that they could use in really brutalistic interrogations. Um, and for the sake of time, we don't have to, if you, it's a really neat book. There's about 40 pages in there that talks about some of like the funny and ridiculous and some of the horrific things that they uh, did when experimenting. Um, you know, some of it on CIA operatives and, and uh, foreign detainees, um, some on psychiatric patients, unfortunately, um, sometimes on each other for fun, kind of dosing each other and seeing what would happen. Uh, and that was uh, sort of a part of the protocol because they wanted to see when a person was spontaneously given the drug, what would happen? And so a person would have it in their morning coffee and say, guess what? You got to take the day off and go home and we're going to observe you. So um, <clears throat> so at the same time, LSD was being studied in university settings in clinical settings as a psychotomimetic. So um, mimicking the effects of psychosis. And you guys probably know this from like your coursework, right? But um, the earliest uh, first generation of antipsychotics were studied because there was this model that LSD creates schizophrenia or temporary schizophrenic state in the mind. Um, and so they were looking for drugs that would help to counter the LSD state. Uh, so as well as uh, antipsychotics work, um, you know, perhaps there's some like, you know, mistaken um, logic there. Um, by 1971, with the exception of a small number of licenses given to CIA and Army intelligence officers, researchers, um, psychedelics were prohibited, classical psychedelics, LSD, DMT, um, psilocybin, things like that. By uh, the mid-70s, though, there was a, an interest in, a growing interest in how to incorporate a new class of drugs, sometimes referred to as empathogens or intactogens like MDMA. You guys are, um, which is methyl methamphetamine, used to be known as ecstasy, now known as, as, as molly, um, used as an adjunct uh, for psychotherapy, especially um, in treating trauma and in uh, working in with couples. And there were some studies that were starting to come out to suggest uh, that this uh, could be a very helpful adjunct to treatment. Um, uh, for better or worse, though, it became a very popular drug in the, in the gay club scene. And so uh, the U.S. clamped down, or at least that was their rationale. We don't know if that's really why they clamped down um, or what, but. <clears throat> I don't want to go too far into it, but if you're interested in a lot of the research and the protocols that were being developed at that time in the 70s to use drugs to help to understand consciousness and to grow, Stan Groff, who's one of the couple people that maintained a license to use LSD consistently uh, in research has this good book, under the Realms of the Human Consciousness. By 1985, MDA had been scheduled as a, a Schedule One drug in the US, which means there's like no therapeutic or you know beneficial purpose of it. Um, and at that time, let me, let's, um, uh, Rick Doblin and uh, a couple other uh, individuals who are very interested in um, the potential benefit for society of, of psychedelics being accessible, especially MDMA, it developed something which most people haven't heard of called EMDL, which stands for the Earth Metabolic Design Lab, which is pretty far out. That was the precursor to, to MAPS. Um, shortly after uh, the FDA succeeded in scheduling it as Schedule 1, um, MAPS was founded and started some 35, 40 year course to try to get um, research evidence to establish the uh, potential therapeutic benefit of, of these uh, drugs. Some people say 2008 really is an important year um, and when the actual psychedelic renaissance um, began or resumed because that's when uh, the FDA approved the first study for using LSD um, it was sort of, it was a Swedish study but they like approved the IRB or something so it wasn't done here. Um, so it used to treat end of life anxiety. Why is that important? Well. Psilocybin and um, MDMA, and DMT, and a number of other things have been approved for research purposes, but probably because of the association with radical counterculture, um, it took a long time for LSD to be approved to be used for anything. So uh, as some of you may uh, be aware, in 2021, there was this landmark article that came out in Nature, really top tier journal, um, showing the efficacy of MDMA um, in, in substance-assisted psychotherapy for treating PTSD. These were for severe cases, but had a very strong effect size of like 0.91 is the, uh, the D. So even though it seems like maybe just the past two, three, four years, there's been buzz, media coverage around psychedelic studies have been ongoing for some three, four decades now, and evidence is rolling in to suggest um, therapeutic, uh, you know, use of, of uh, certain substances for helping with certain 
um, emotional struggles, mental illnesses. So um, ibogaine and LSD for substance use disorders. I don't know if people are familiar with the history of AA. This is something I learned about not that long ago. So Bill, whatever his name was that founded um, AA, um, this approach, uh, the 12 step approach sort of as it is now was um, in lieu of not being able to do his original plan because um, he achieved uh, sobriety from alcohol after a massive LSD trip. And he turned on a series of people to LSD with these large trips um, and were able to work through all kinds of things and was starting to um, collaborate with researchers to try to develop an approach to this. But some people were having really strong reactions, negative reactions. You know, maybe they had trauma histories or something. And also, apparently, it was difficult um, in the 50s to, to access the chemical um, even though it wasn't uh, it wasn't illegal, it was uh, difficult to synthesize. So, um, so that's when he, you know, uh, reached out to Carl Jung and uh, developed, you know, the big book and a lot of these uh, materials that are based on the assumption that people that are um, alcoholic or have alcohol use disorder are malignant narcissists, and so you need a protocol to help them overcome that. That's sort of the origin of it. So, it's a bit of an aside. De depressive disorders, you can now get ketamine through the mail or go to an clinic in most cities to get treatment for that. Um, illness anxiety with psilocybin and LSD. Some studies show good treatment with OCD and the same substances too. So one neat thing about, you know, about psychedelic therapy options is that while protocols differ in terms of the, the frequency and the length of treatment, it doesn't tend to be like an ongoing thing. So whether it's one session or three sessions, um, we're talking about a limited interval and a limited number of times the person has to show up to treatment. So as you guys are probably aware from like a lot of EPT type studies, treatment dropout, treatment dropout is a, a, a big problem. So um, the less times a person has to show up for treatment, the more likely they're going to um, complete. So this is the study I mentioned before. Actually, it's the same authors two years later, um, and they've... Uh, published a phase three study in their um, same thing using MDMA therapy for severe PTSD. And actually this is moderate to severe. So they actually found uh, good results here. So the, the protocol is like they have people come over the course of three months. Um, they come in three different days and they have an eight hour dosing session where they have two supportive therapists that are there to help them work through um, whatever content comes up in a very non-structured, non-directive way. And they uh, they found significant results. What I think interesting here is like the placebo condition is not placebo in the sense of no treatment at all. Um, it's placebo in the sense that they still, the people in the placebo condition were still getting eight hours of therapy um, uh, and the sugar pill or something like that. So they still got quite a bit of treatment and you can see that that group improved. Um, but compared to the MDMA group with the therapy, um, pretty large effect size there, 0.7. And that's on the CAPS-5 clinician administered uh, PTSD scale. And also this SDS is a disability scale. They show improvements there as well. So this comes directly from the MAPS manual for the study. Um, and I wanna share a link to this. I don't know how I do this from in this view here. Let's see how we get to chat. Okay. So MAPS, again, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Science, they're not the only sort of game in town or organization doing psychedelic studies in uh, the US, but they've done a lot to move it forward. Uh, and this is the manual that they used for this uh, study that spells out the protocol. It has a lot of interesting things in there, some of which I'm going to read you about the role of the therapist. Um, so it's not structured in the sense of like, you know, some of these are like very much scripted. And then you say this, and then you say this, and, you know, this is the activity. So this is not that. Um, here. Okay, so now people have probably read, read that slide, right? But um, so the therapists are prompted to find a balance between focusing on the person's inner experience and providing a safe place for exploring the experience in an open way, respecting inner healing intelligence, 
um, that's within that person and weaving in periods of interaction with periods of silent witnessing. So there's a degree of like attunement that's needed, right? With uh, between the, the therapist and the client. Um, and at times periods of silence, uh, being supportive at times, determining whether suggestions or encouragement or further inquiry may be beneficial. At other times the therapist may be encouraged participant to discontinue talking and focus on their inner experience. Um, I don't remember the stats on this, but most of the, the people that are involved in this have been therapists for a while, so they're not sort of brand new um, in doing this work. What about dissociative disorders, though? Um, because as we know, sometimes people come in with really severe PTSD and there's actually dissociation going on that they they don't know how to talk about or they don't endorse. It's just not, you know, determined. So in it's another section of the manual, they say, um, it's important that therapists understand manifestations of multiplicity of the psyche are a normal phenomena. So they really sort of depathologize this, but maybe more pronounced in those who experience trauma. So you can think of it as dissociation, regression of the appearance of different parts or selves or subpersonalities. They want to give these have different theoretical traditions. They don't want to give it different options. Uh, the participant can talk about inner experiences in terms of awareness of different parts of the psyche, and it's essential that such experiences not be pathologized by the therapist. Uh, which is which is really helpful. Not for the transition strong. Here we go. So before we discuss a, a, a detailed model that sort of summarizes um, other models that are out there in terms of how to conduct uh, SAPT, here's some general considerations. Schenberg uh, recommends that rather than thinking of drug efficacy, while you know, the drugs that uh, people are taking certainly have an effect, you know, on the brain. And perhaps regardless of the, you know, the uh, the way the experience is structured, perhaps they'd experience some relief or some progress. Starting to think about experience efficacy um, is important. Um, what's happening in the inner world of the client and what's being done to facilitate that process. Thal and colleagues from a review that came out a couple months ago say, um, it's important to respect their inner wisdom the idea here is that the therapist as the expert is probably not going to be helpful. Uh, like Winter was saying earlier, you know, that autonomy, that ability to explore yourself and come to your own conclusions is really helpful. And Garcia, Ramon, and Richards um, say that uh, the process can lead to the development of new insights and perspectives, especially about patterns of thought and emotion, habitual reactions, relationship to the self and the others, and, and trauma memories. This is an article I just stumbled upon the other night um, uh, Alexander and Bill Brennan, um, psychologist and psychedelic researcher, consultant, uh, work at Cybin, which is a company that uh, is developing psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for depression. They looked at 17 different models of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, and they came up with a, a set of considerations um, that they entitled Embark. So isn't, that, isn't that witty? Um, and, but it's the first letter there is the first letter of these different components. Uh, neat when that works out can be used by both licensed therapists and psychedelic guides or facilitators. And so six areas of focus. Um, mindfulness here can mean different things in different contexts, right? Uh, but here it's talking about the individual's absorption and what aspects of their consciousness are being unlocked during the psychedelic experience. Bodily awareness, you think about people who have a body dysmorphia, maybe who have experienced their bodies have been traumatized, how powerful this could be. Areas of sensation maybe could be used as trailheads that could be followed over the course of the trip. Um, it's worth mentioning, though, that different, you know, different psycho psychedelic substances are going to affect uh, each of these in different ways. So like um, a person on like a moderate dose of ketamine or higher uh, is going to experience a sense of disconnection from their body. Um, maybe that's helpful for, for some people. Maybe it's disturbing for others, whereas MDMA um, assisted therapy, people are going to feel more embodied and experience pleasure in their in their body, and that could be facilitative of other sorts of healing. Uh, the affective cognitive component, kind of at 430 there, comes, um, I think affect comes before cognitive for more than alphabetical reasons. Um, during a psychedelic experience, uh, intellectual realizations are often preceded by strong surges of emotion. So a competent facilitator will help the person come to engage with the material as it's revealed rather than trying to direct or channel their, their thoughts or feelings. And relationally, um, what says dissolve boundaries, and I think we think as therapists of like, oh, boundaries are good and healthy and necessary. Do we want to dissolve boundaries? Um, but in a strong psychedelic experience, 
uh, properly guided, a person can come to develop a greater sense of uh, empathy for specific others or groups of people, the species, maybe all sentient beings, um, by uh, becoming aware of the permeability of the boundaries of the interconnectivity of everyone. Um, keeping momentum, what they're talking about here is that ideally the psychedelic experience does not um, end after the acute effects of the drug have waned. Discussions with therapists and sometimes others who've taken the medication hours and sometimes days later, even weeks later is recommended. So uh, because the emotions and realizations that are, that are unveiled uh, can be scaffolded upon and ideas for creating change can be uh, generated and, and, and pursued. And then finally, the existential spiritual component. So pretty frequently during these sessions, people who didn't consider themselves religious or uh, spiritual in nature find themselves connecting with what they perceive to be divine or um, at least a profound sense of uh, connection with, with their fellow, uh, fellow human beings, maybe animals too, um, a deep sense of personal meaning coming from that. So uh, this can be explored to really good effect um, in, uh, you know, sessions following or um, in, in integration circles, which may be part of the study. Or if you just Google integration circle, uh, you can find ones online or ones that are probably near where you live to that are not specific to a particular treatment center or study. Okay, so I think I'm going to go through these pretty quickly here. Three different stages. Um, you know, preparation, administration, and integration. So you want to make sure a person is meeting, you know, if you're running a research study or you're running a cl clinic, maybe it's a bit different. If you're running a clinic, maybe it's not as important to you that a person have, uh, you know, a, a, single, a single diagnosis and meet certain criteria. Um, but maybe you want to screen certain people out. If people are actively psychotic, probably not a good idea, for instance. Um, measuring something at the baseline relative to whatever you're trying to treat there. Um, building a therapeutic alliance is important. Um, while this is not long-term therapy, them having a sense of trust in the person that's facilitating the experience is very important. Um, giving them an idea of what to expect, um, both because it overcomes uh, you know, the jitters, uncertainty around it, um, and also you want to build a positive expectancy. Grounding techniques can be taught if they're not known. Um, although some people would say, well, grounding kind of goes uh, more in the camp of trying to control things and maybe you don't want people to feel like they have to control things, but not bad to, to have coping skills. And then importantly, the intention, what's the purpose? And that may change over the course of, of the trip, but um, prompting and encouraging the person through thinking about it, talking about it, maybe journaling about it immediately before or a while before what they'd like to learn, what they'd like to accomplish. And then, okay, that's enough of that. <clears throat> Administration, um, often done using a psychotherapist, shaman, or helping individual, though there are some at-home treatments, you know, Mind Bloom and Smith Family Pharmacy both offer at-home uh, treatment options. There's not a therapist with you, but you check in before and after um, on a Zoom call. So there's the question of how many sessions, how frequent, how's it going to be administered? What's the setting like? Um, in the MAPS studies, you know, they have people come for, they come one night and then they sleep there. So they're not stressed the next morning about having to rush there. They're there for a full day for the psychedelic experience. Then they stay over again. Uh, and then they have a full day to um, go through integration activities. Um, where other places, a lot of these uh, ketamine clinics that are run by anesthesiologists, you know, you, you get picked up two hours after you're dropped off and you're done with the experience. A lot of places say if, if it's going to be the kind of psychedelic assisted therapy where therapists are there, having two is better than one. And there's a question of what role is the therapist going to, to play? So just to talk briefly about integration here. Um, according to Achala, uh, you can think of integration as a process for supporting elevated comprehension of the experience and effective application of insights and lessons that are gained um, for day-to-day -day experiences. Walsh and Tyson say, um, trying to develop and increase the malleability, the flexibility of their self-narrative, how they understand themselves, others, the world, as well as any trauma history. Thal and colleagues, Sasha Thal from down in Perth, Australia, he was going to um, 
he lost funding, but he was going to come and present uh, with us at the, the forum at ISSTD. But um, he and his colleagues looked at 75 published works, trying to find commonalities and differences between integration approaches. Found there are a few empirical studies. A lot of these are based on treatment manuals or book chapters and things. Um, broadly speaking, they tend to be humanistic and experiential, non-directive, just validating and encouraging uh, for people to come to their own insights. Um, yeah. Just some other thoughts on integration. Early wine and colleagues um, interviewed 30 different integration therapists that do this exclusively, or it's a big part of their practice, and surmised that um, from these, these people tend to approach this as a bridge from the psychedelic experience to everyday life. It helps the client make sense of their experiences in a really personalized way. And hopefully leads to a sense of wholeness uh, and completion. So as I say, the format varies depending on the center or the study. <clears throat> a lot of them are, will incorporate concepts and techniques from third wave behavior therapies, things like um, uh, DBT or ACT, stuff like that, uh, cognitive behavioral, mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy. But Bastier and colleagues say that um, individuals can uh, do other things to, to integrate, you know, reflecting on their own, journaling, or engaging in creative arts, finding integration circles. So I did want to talk about this study. I just came across this. This is from two months ago. It was published. Um, Weiss and his colleagues uh, did a thematic analysis. They talked to 218 individuals who had taken classical psychedelics. So these are things like uh, DMT, LSD, and psilocybin. And um, they, uh, not as part of a study on their own accord, on their own accord doesn't sound right, outside of the, the treatment setting or research setting. And so they did exploratory factor analysis and found eight domains when they were looking for themes, said uh, individuals found that there were increases in um, one or more of these, these areas uh, in, in their narratives. The, that unitive spiritual dimension, either feeling more connected to, um, to God, to the infinite, to each other. Uh, increased capacity for absorption, which is the ability to um, just become very engrossed, uh, singularly focused and, and, and uh, take in something with your consciousness. Uh, more of a sense of uh, not being confined or, or limited to a certain trajectory, to be uh, free to do things and to find purpose in what you're doing. Um, most or a lot of them reported a greater sense of compassion for others and understanding, being more emotionally stable overall. This is all their own self-perception, being more open to the perceptives of others, perspectives of others, so less sort of narcissistic or one-minded, and also being more connected to um, to to themselves. Sounds sort of very IFS speak. And then finally, and individuals that in, whose narrative. Um, showed this didn't tend to have many of the other things, um, more neuroticism or caution. This was seven seven percent of participants. So um, my mind says, okay, are these people that might develop HPPD? Are these people with a trauma history? Are these people that were overwhelmed by what was revealed as part of the experience? So it's a lot of talking. I'm almost done. I promise. Um, what does psychedelic medicine have to do with you? Well, it's likely if you haven't already that you're going to encounter clients with questions about psychedelic medicine. Um, say some may want to explore or integrate challenging experiences that they've had after um, the medication is out of their system. And you may also choose to incorporate psychedelics with a, with a provider, a prescriber rather, into your practice. Um, or you may have clients that come in um, and want to talk about what's happened in a, in a recent treatment. So because trauma content often will, will emerge during these experiences, even in clients who um, weren't aware before, were with only limited awareness that they've been traumatized. There are um, some references here that you can check out if you want. And then I had some questions that we can discuss, um, but I'm open to talking about anything. I'll just lob these out there though, in case people wanna talk about them. How would you feel about integrating psychedelic medicine into your practice? Um, how do people feel about all this excitement with the psychedelics? Is it, is it too much? Does it need to be tamped down a bit? Um, could psychedelic medicine ever replace traditional therapy? And um, what do people think about whether people that are doing this work, if they should have had their own experiences with psychedelics? So we can talk about 
some, all, or none of those. Um, and I'm just going to end the, the show here. OK. Um, yeah, what do you guys want to talk about? I think we've got like 20 minutes here. I have a question. Oh, don't worry. Oh, hey. <laughs> hey. Um, now I forget my question. Oh, okay. So what kinds of like specific certifications or trainings do you need for these kinds of therapies, like to, to administer the therapy? Yeah. Um, well, it, 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 I would say it, it depends, you know, um, certainly there are people without any kind of certification or training uh, that are, that are doing this work and sort of figuring their way, their way through it. Um, there are, and I'll, um, maybe I can share in an email with, uh, Dr. Ellis and she can circulate, uh, some of the places that provide, uh, trainings. There are some that have been around for a few years. Um, you know, I think, I think it, two things, I think having some specialized training is really helpful because some of the things that you learn, especially as a trauma therapist will be really helpful in these kind of experiences, but there's a lot of wrought intense emotion, um, and you're trusting and encouraging the client, but there are things that would be very different. So, um, but also part of me says, um, because I've seen the prices of some of these courses that are like five or $10,000. And I say, man, maybe I got into the wrong field. Maybe I should have gotten into the, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the, the field of uh, hosting these kind of trainings or putting them together. So um, sorry, that's a, a cynical uh, a tangent there, but yeah, there are, um, there, there are courses that are anywhere from three or four hours that'll cost you like a hundred dollars uh, to ones where you're going to um, study with for two weeks that are five to $10,000. And I'll, I'll send some options that you guys can look at. My question is kind of in line with that. So my understanding was that this is only feasible in certain states. Like I know ketamine is done here in Florida, but as far as like ayahuasca, psilocybin, that kind of stuff, I thought that that was like state dependent. And I don't know. I, I don't know. So I was curious if you had any more information on that. Yeah, yeah, I think you you, you know you hit hit it right on the nose there. Uh, there are uh, there's variability from from state to state. I think that ketamine is everywhere now because it's you know it's a federally scheduled thing. And what allowed for restrictions to be lifted there were uh, during the time of COVID, um, certain treatments that were once only available at uh, inpatient or in office treatment centers became possible like at home or in least restrictive settings. And uh, so far those uh, restrictions have not been reinstated. So but yeah, on ayahuasca, I think, I don't know too much about that, but I think like um, in order to make ayahuasca or to prepare it, you have to bring two different components together and it's okay to have the components, but not to put them together and take it. But I, I've heard it's like legal to grow. So some people will do it themselves. I'm not recommending that. Um, but I, I, I think right now they, there's this whole uh, industry around um, luxury vacations, uh, some more bare bone and some like really lavish that where people will go to Central or South America and have a two or three day or week long experience. Um, you know, that is usually somewhere in the range of a few thousand dollars, but I don't know that there's anywhere in the U.S. I don't, and I, I think there's some research studies that are underway that MAPS is doing involving Ibogaine or Ayahuasca. Um, but in terms of people being able to just go out and find a treatment center locally in the U.S., I don't think it's there for that. And, you know, MDMA is in stage three trials. So you know, some people say in two to three years, it should be the kind of thing that you can go to like a local treatment center. There's already like an infrastructure that's starting to be developed in anticipation of that. Thanks, Other thanks. Thoughts? Yeah, sure. Other thoughts and questions, guys? Um, I have so many thoughts and questions. I really appreciate your presentation. Um, I was wondering, I liked your last question on the slide. Like, I think it's really important that therapies go to therapy um, in general. And I'm wondering, like, I feel like if we're doing this with other folks, like, should we experience this too? Um, like to know what it feels like, especially since it's, I don't know, I don't know how to like verbalize it, but it's a subjective experience, but I feel like, like bad trips, or like, how how are we supposed to navigate those if we haven't gone through this ourselves or like we haven't gone through the treatment ourselves? I feel like going to therapy in general helps be a better therapist. So I think 
I think that's what I'm trying to say. Sorry, I'm running on low sleep. Oh, no worries. That was really um, concise, articulate, and I, I get what you're saying, and I can see, um, relate to some of that, but uh, do, on that point, how do others feel about it? Um, do other people see that differently? Uh, Bryn, I don't know if you were going to speak on that or something different. Yeah, I um, I agree with Paige. I do think that it's important that therapists go to therapy, um, but on that the flip side, as far as um, do they need to do these substances? I think that like, if you think about, you know, does a trauma therapist have to experience trauma? Does somebody treating um, someone who has psychosis symptoms have to experience psychosis in, in order to fully understand? I think if we're like well-informed and understanding um, the process of these things and what they can look like for people and what to expect and how to respond to them. I do think that it would be appropriate if someone isn't comfortable doing it, um, to still be able to work with people who choose to do it, but I can see how it would be helpful to know and understand like what the experience is fully like. Okay. Yeah. What, what do other people think? I mean, I think that I definitely agree with what Bran was saying about like we can't experience every single thing that our clients have experienced, but I feel like these sorts of substances are unique experiences and they're like, it's one thing to know what an ab reaction might look like or some of the resistance that that person might feel. And there are different like journeys that each person might be on in their trip. But at the same time, I feel like it's it's something that is relatively simple. It's a finite time period. And it gives us this level of insight into what their experience is going to be like physically, emotionally, mentally, that could really give an edge to being able to help guide somebody through that. So I feel like this is something that would be a little bit easier to kind of like if I were doing this, I would want somebody who knows what I'm about to experience, because if it's just what they learned in a book, then do they truly like understand when I'm freaking out? <laughs> Other thoughts, guys? I I agree with Amanda and Brie and I were just talking to, I think, and I think especially because doing um, like psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, I can imagine that for some people, especially with people with trauma histories, that kind of, although you're intentionally going to use the drug, you know, there is still a sense of loss of control. So it would be nice to know that there's someone who knows how that feels and can kind of help me not panic in that moment or help me safely explore my panic of not being in control. So I, I I agree with Amanda actually, but I can also see what what Brian is saying because if you know a trauma a person with post trauma provides trauma informed therapy, but they haven't gone through their own process of like you know of therapy and all that stuff, you know, it can be easy to get too much, like like the counter transference isn't helpful anymore. So um, I think it's a fine line probably. I'm curious though, like along with what Brian is saying wouldn't we then be expecting psychiatrists and nurse practitioners and even PCPs to take clonopin to know what that feels like or to take Adderall to know what that feels like or God help us all antidepressants, right? So it's it's a slippery slope where I I hear what everyone's saying and I and I semi agree. Um but then I think we would need to reconsider all of the other facets where people are prescribing things and maybe not also partaking and aware of the seriousness of those side effects. Yeah, I agree. And I'm thinking though, because of the unique part of the trip experience, like having a trip, which would be different than like taking like, um, like Zoloft, Zoloft yeah. or something like that, where you're tripping on this drug, I feel like it's slightly different mm. it's like a more intense experience than just like like the medication effect like I feel like you are intentionally losing that control and I do understand like we haven't done EMDR or hypnosis like we haven't done these forms of therapy where like somebody might feel like they're losing that control 
So I get that, but I do feel like the substance itself is unique. I don't know that it should be required. So wait, wait, stay with that language though. Stay with that. Cause that, I think that's what I'm, I'm harping on is that y'all are saying that it's a unique experience. So if it's unique, then what would the benefit be? Like my trip would be different than your trip. So what, how would that generalize? I feel like you feel that the, like one of the the themes that came up in, I'm sorry, I'm getting really excited. (laughs) Um, One of the themes that came up in one of the qualitative studies he just showed um, in the vice study or yeah, W-E-I-S was spiritual unity and, or like a sense of being together or connected. And I feel like that is a common theme among most people that take it. So I feel like knowing what that feels like and then being, if you are experiencing a bad trip, it can be all subjective still, but still there's like a, a thing that connects it if I'm making sense, but like when you drift away from feeling connect, then that's kind of where you want somebody who's drifted away before to bring you back into the connection. I feel like just conceptualizing what therapy usually is, it's like, you don't have to have the experience, but if you do have that experience, there's a lot more to maybe like pull from and reflect on and like this deeper level of understanding and like understanding what that sphere that spiritual connection is understanding like the nausea or the out of body experience, like these different nuanced elements of it can like help to identify and empathize and help guide someone through that experience, maybe more effectively is yeah. Just my thoughts on that. I, I agree. Like with everybody pretty much right it's it's a it's a nuanced situation it just depends on I feel like what is your comfort level and of course somebody you know the the client therapist relationship is going to matter and if there is a connection there because of things that you've experienced that connection is going to be deepened and you're going to be able to help them on a level that somebody who hasn't experienced that that's probably true but what happens just to play devil's advocate if you do this because you think, you know, you're going to be able to help somebody through the process and you end up with um, an adverse effect of, you know, experiencing um, the negative sides. And then you can't show up for your clients that you've had long term or short term or, you know, there's there's still risk. Um, so I think it's it really needs to be like an individualized decision. And, and if you feel comfortable doing it, then do it, but don't do it because like in the name of being able to help somebody else through it, if that's what you want to do, that's, that's my opinion on it. And Brian, you're just making me think too, like, I think maybe, and I think what you and Dr. Ellis kind of are making a good point is that are we, are we then engaging in it to help or are we engaging because it's going to make us feel more credible, which then we need to like, look at that. Like, why don't we feel credible? Like, you know what I mean? So if I, I was just thinking now, like we have an intern who is helping, who is providing services to someone who just had a baby. So is she less credible because she's never had a baby, you know, it, and if, and then if that client feels that way, that's something to explore in the therapy room. So that just made me think of that too. So that's actually like for the devil's advocate section, little point there. So interesting. It's very interesting. So many good points are, are being brought up and just, I, I don't know where I land on this, on this either. You know, I can say, um, Personally, it's 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 been helpful uh, to understand um, what's happening to the mind from a you know lived perspective. You know when people are uh, having these experiences. Um, I I guess one argument for why I don't know about necessary, but maybe helpful to to have had certain experiences for some clinicians, depending on the the drug and the treatment setting and the assumptions and the intention of the trip. But um, you know I think about psychoanalysis, right? I mean, if you're going to be board certified in psychoanalysis, you have to have gone through three four hundred sessions of it yourself. So is that model that Though a lot of people are very critical of that and say, uh, you know, there are all kinds of financial constraints and well, that, you know, favors like a, an elite group of people that can afford that kind of thing. So I know that there are problems with that, but um, I, I would share that I talked to um, three people that run ketamine uh, treatment centers because I was interested in um, the way that they, uh, that they approach treatment, their, their assumptions and how they conduct it. And um, all three of them were pretty similar when I started the first time I talked to the people. Uh, two of them still are, and people go there essentially. They're put in a room. It's very sort of medicalized. Uh, they lay on a, a you know 
you know, padded bench or something like that with a paper cloth, the paper cover on it or something like that. And they're given a shot or they're given the snort of spravata, which is a powderized version of the um, S isomer of, of ketamine. And, uh, you know, and then they're checked in on every 15 minutes for adverse reactions. It's not a very warm, fuzzy, conducive, encouraging experience. Uh, the third place was similar to that. Uh, and I learned about it from a guy, uh, Norman Alessi, who it's in Ann Arbor. He has a ketamine treatment center there. And uh, yeah, I met him at the conference last year, ISSTD, and I've been chatting with him since about, you know, about drugs and doing a forum and stuff. Um, and he experimented, he's very open with this, with ketamine himself. Um, because he was inspired by like an interest in what was happening to some of the clients when he'd check in and talk with them. And after he had the experience, he said, my gosh, there's so much happening um, inside that we could be, we could take the uh, really tapping into and, 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 and um, assisting the person with, not just like leaving them to lay there. And, and um, so uh, he's switched his practice up a lot. Now he's seeing like a lot of CPTSD and DID cases and doing active psychotherapy using what they'd call a psycholytic dose. So this is a sort of um, enough so that it's above the threshold of detection. There's some like, you know, trippy kind of stuff going on with visual field, but a person is as like cognizant enough to, to discuss because ketamine is pretty dissociative. So if you give people, uh, you know, they're just going to drool if you give them like a high dose and stare at the wall. There's stuff going on that they're not going to interact with you. So they found that dose. Um, anyway. It's one of those clinics, the couples, the one who does it with couples. Oh, th those are... Um, uh, people that are kind of like off the radar now uh, they're um, oh, yes. those, those people yeah um other thoughts about about this or other things about psychedelics i just thank you for this talk like it's so it's not something i know anything about so this was really really informative for me so thank you so much for for giving this talk Oh, it's been my pleasure. I'm really grateful for you guys for showing up and being willing to um, bring your good insights and, and uh, perspectives and, and ideas. And um, yeah, so uh, I'm just going to take a moment to show you the site for ISSTD's upcoming conference. Uh, if you're interested, and of course, you all are interested in trauma and dissociation, but it's such a unique environment. And um, I don't go to a lot of conferences. And really, this is the only one I go to every year, just because it's so warm and inclusive and encouraging. And I feel like I've been to therapy after like I leave there, like good supportive therapy, like a, a good therapy session at the end of the- I told you all, it's like the vibes of ISSTD. Yeah. It's just warm and fuzzy. Totally, totally. Um, share, how do I go? Oh, darn it. Okay, I'll do that. So yeah, I said like healing, healing power of dignity is this year's theme. And you can see some of the, the, the talks uh, that are coming up, um, race in the room, uh, race and cultural differences, stay open or closed doors, hidden stories of neglect, intersection of LGBTQIA, identity and religiosity, association. There's a neat one by Elizabeth Howell, who's like a great mind. She wrote well, she wrote The Dissociative Mind, which is a seminal text in dissociation, but she's always branching out to something new. And where is she? There's our thing there. Um, traumatizing loss of dignity and dementia. Such a, such a neat, neat topic if you've worked with any older clients as they're starting to lose their faculties. So I know that um, I remember how... Uh, impoverished I was at times in grad school and I know it's not cheap there are discounts for memberships there's discounts for conference attendance we just launched a program this year at ISSTD sponsorship so if you're interested you'd like to go to the conference or you'd like membership it's just not in the budget um, you know reach out send me an email and I'm, I'm happy to try to do what I can to connect you with a sponsor that maybe help to subsidize uh, the cost and um, this is the, the last year I think for a while that we're doing a lot of these online any of those with the camera you see you can do online attendance and uh, if you can't attend, but you like what you see on one of those, there'll be a lot of those available, like a la carte webinars in a couple months. So, um, Sophia. Yes, sorry. So now that I'm like, I just got accepted to SID and I'm super intrigued on trauma. I love trauma. I just wanted to know how did you decide to go into that track? Like, and no, for example, other track. Like, I know trauma is huge. How did you decide, okay, this is what I want and this is what I research? Um, I think, you know, like, like a lot of people, I have some, you know, experience in my past that uh, I was curious about it. I think it was just, I hadn't done enough of my own sort of healing and figuring my own stuff out when I was in grad school. So that's part of why I didn't, pursue training in it. I think it was just too close to home. But, you know, after I'd been through enough therapy myself and done enough healing, I said, wow, now this stuff is making sense to me. And it was so darn hard to figure out what dissociation is and how it affects the mind. So, um, you know, I said, oh, maybe I can be helpful um, 
you know, to, to other people with that. So, and there's just such a need for it. You know, I mean, more and more as a society, we're realizing just all the different sorts of things that can can be be traumatic and and uh, you know complex and intensify and you know aggregate to to harm people. So, thanks for the question. Um, Thank any, you. Sure. Any other questions or final thoughts? Well, thank you guys again so much for having me. Um, oh, thank you. Seriously, this was amazing. And unfortunately, it was so good that I'm going to probably harass you to do another one. Oh, it'd be my pleasure. Thanks, Oh, Amy. okay, cool. <laughs> well, you know, doc Dr. Ellis has been kind enough to present for ISSTD and locally for like the city I live, you know, for psychologists there. She's always that was fun. donating her time. So um, I, I definitely owe you more than one. So thanks. Listen, I like it. I like the back and forth. It's beautiful reciprocal relationship. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for attending. Um, and really, thank you, John, so much for making your yourself available. And I look forward to the next time we have you come. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.